Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia, and thank you very much for joining us. I am Laura Kovacs, and I am honored to be here. Cheryl Cashin is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Law, Civil Rights, and Social Justice at Georgetown University, and an active member of the Poverty and Race Research Action Council. She formerly worked in the Clinton White House as an advisor on urban and economic policy, particularly concerning community development in inner city neighborhoods. Her previous books include The Failures of Integration, The Agitator's Daughter, and Place, Not Race. Her new book, White Space, Black Hood, uses two decades of data to expose the ways in which the United States government has fostered inequality. She'll be joined this evening in conversation with Richard Rothstein, Distinguished Fellow of the Economic Policy Institute and author of the best-selling book, The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. Thank you so much for being here. The screen is all yours. Thank you. Sherilyn, why don't you just begin by telling us about your book? Okay. Well, I want to begin by thanking the Free Library of Philadelphia and everybody who's uh, appearing, I mean, to, watching us tonight. You could have done anything with your evening, and I appreciate you coming. So uh, my book, White Space, Black Hood, um, I argue that there's no way to understand the persistence of racial inequality in this country without understanding that we have a caste system and that geography is at the center of it. Um, through nearly a century of past and present public policies, excuse me, we overinvest and exclude in affluent white space, and we disinvest and prey on people, frankly, in high poverty black neighborhoods, those are the extreme of, of residential caste. And, and we tell stories and fabulize, mythologize about um, the people in the hood to justify the way things are. And, and the big, biggest myth of all is that uh, high opportunity living is earned and hood living is the deserved result of individual bad behavior. Uh, in, 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 a residential caste is ingenious in its ability to mask what is really a system where we um, systemically uh, funnel resources to high opportunity places. And in fact, all of the people who can't afford to buy their way into affluent space um, subsidize the people in those spaces with their gas tax dollars and, and, and everything else. Um, and so th th that is the main point of the book. And I shine a light on three primary principles, current processes of anti-Black residential caste, boundary maintenance, segregation, opportunity hoarding, and stereotype-driven surveillance. Uh, and the beauty, uh, once you understand these processes and you understand how residential caste works, then there's an automatic um, way forward, uh, a, a neighborhood residential based way forward where you just reverse those, ab abolish those processes and repair. Um, so that's, and I call for abolition and repair at the end of the book. So that's a brief overview of what I set out to do. And it's the result of decades of, of um, academic work, but also, you know, I, I am a self-taught historian I marry history to the present. Every time this country seemed to have put to bed a black subordinating institution, it created another one from slavery to Jim Crow to the uh, iconic ghetto. Um, and I call the people trapped in, um, well, I call the hood now, um, descendants in recognition of that unbroken continuum. Uh, descendants trapped in high poverty neighborhoods are the true descendants of slavery. So that's it, the overview. Well, let me uh, begin with that point because mm -hmm. you also talk about um, blacks and Latinos, black and brown people, mm -hmm. but they're not all descendants. So how do you distinguish between the two in terms of repair? Well, I'm upfront 
from the beginning of the book that residential caste was constructed, as you know, well know, um, as a response to the great migrants, right? Six, seven million Black Americans leave the South over, de over several, de many decades in the 20th century. The primary response to Black people moving North and West for opportunity was to contain them in their own neighborhoods. And so it's, it's an anti-Black institution. Other people get ensnared in it, but Black Americans are the only group in the 20th century that were subjected to what uh, Massey and Denton call hypersegregation, right? Segregation to this day is the dominant experience for Black Americans in terms of their, how their opportunities are shaped, right? It's not to say that um, Latinx people um, uh, have not been affected by it, but um, the anti-Black um, animus is what got us down this road of constructing uh, white space apart from Black space. Um, but everybody suffers from it. Well, I, I'm skipping ahead. You, you mentioned repair. Right. Um, are the same policies uh, necessary to repair the um, uh, conditions of descendants as the conditions of immigrants like Latinos? Well, that's a complicated question. Um, I do not deny that there are other groups that are, have been subjected to historic and present oppression, right? Um, but there's a singular Black American person. What I focus on in the chapter on repair is that the, the structure that has not been dismantled, the structure of white supremacy that has not been dismantled despite a civil rights revolution is high poverty Black neighborhoods. Um, concentrated Black poverty was an intentional government institution. And the same Black neighborhoods that you write about in your book that were redlined in the 30s, right? To this day, um, there's, I cite a Fed study which found 80 years later, predominantly Black neighborhoods that were marked as hazardous um, in the 30s suffer disinvestment, distress, segregation that can be tied to that. And, and in fact, um, my, when I argue, argue for abolition and repair, I argue for prioritizing the people who live in those marked neighborhoods, right? If, if you are um, a, a poor person, a Hispanic person who lives in those marked neighborhoods, you would be um, addressed by a remedy that um, you know, I say you should, we need to reverse all of the, the, the anti-Black policies. So, you know, inclusionary zoning rather than exclusionary zoning, um, but uh, disrupting systemic patterns of disinvestment in Black neighborhoods, um, movements for racial equity, programs for racial equity that funnels resources into these historically disadvantaged neighborhoods. Um, uh, and uh, human and repairing the predatory policing that goes on in there, right? So um, yes, it's it's distinct, but it's neighborhood based, right? Um, if there are neighborhoods that are heavily populated, and by, and by the way, it, you know, demographers make clear if you look at the concentrated poverty census tracts, by no means are they all black. Right, a lot of them are black and brown, and increasing they're increasingly um, high poverty white census tracts in in the exurbs and rural areas and in, in, in outer suburbs. Right, but uh, it tends to be historic majority black neighborhoods that have this very specific history. Right, so my my arguments about repair are tied to these neighborhoods uh, more. Uh, rather than just race, you see, um, which actually also makes it easier to, to uh, evade any legal challenges to them. Let me go back to something you just said, because I think perhaps some of the people um, 
watching us tonight don't understand, don't know what you meant by inclusionary zoning and exclusionary zoning. Could you describe those a bit and what you think we should be doing in both of those areas? Sure, and I'm gonna use Philadelphia as an example since we're the free library of Philadelphia. I, I have a vignette in the book about a battle um, to disrupt uh, the growing segregation of wealth and of poverty in the city. Um, I learned about a lot about city center and um, what's that neighborhood? I'm forgetting it right now. That's it's, it's this neighborhood around a park. Oh, I'm forgetting it, but it's, it's near where those two young men got um, arrested for sitting while black in a Starbucks. Rittenhouse Square, the Rittenhouse neighborhood, one of the most affluent neighbors. But city center, I have maps of Philadelphia in the book. And it's pretty shocking, um, um, side by side maps showing the concentration of poverty and of wealth in the city. Well, um, some activists tried to get a mandatory inclusionary housing zone, uh, zoning ordinance passed, which would mandate that any new development in the affluent spaces or in places that don't have their fair share of affordable housing would have to, to, to receive it, right? Um, and that was tabled and instead they did a voluntary zoning uh, ordinance whereby developers would, um, who wanted to build affordable housing would be rewarded with a density bonus, right? Well, let me, let me, let me, again, so I- the, the difference is mandatory inclusionary zoning um, like what Minneapolis recently did, which repealed the, the, the protection that single family home um, neighborhoods get from denser housing, um, mandatory zoning would say any development above a certain size anywhere in the city has to include a certain percentage of affordable units. Affordable to whom? Well, if it's designed correctly, um, the way it ought to be, to give descendants opportunity, um, very low income people should be eligible. The, the best design inclusionary zones that I am aware of is Montgomery County's. Montgomery County, Maryland, a relatively affluent suburb north of, of Washington DC has had on its books, I think it's now 60 years, um, um, since the 70s. Um, a mandatory ordinance, which requires all development above a certain side to include affordable units. And they assign some of those units to the public housing authority, right? Making sure that as new units are built, residents of public housing are getting access to high and medium opportunity neighborhoods. And um, an economist uh, did a study uh, which followed the public housing families, the form, former residents of public housing that got opportunity in high income neighborhoods and compared the outcome of the children to children who stayed behind in schools that were given more resources. And um, the children who got to move to higher ground did better. They performed better, which is consistent with the outcome of the you know, first generation of Gautreaux. Uh, the Gautreau case, which you worked on in Chicago. <laughs> well, um, you know, as you point out in your book, Cheryl, uh, most African Americans are not poor. Uh, they're working class, uh, they're middle class. We have a stereotype of African Americans, they're poor, but most are not. And yet, in places like Philadelphia and other cities around the country, Working class families, disproportionately at the lower end of the working class, but not poor, disproportionately African American, also can't afford housing. Mm -hmm. With the kind of inclusionary zoning program that you propose, which sets aside a share of units for the lowest income families and sells the rest as, um, at market rates, what happens to the middle who are being well, forced out of cities um, because they can't afford housing either? Okay. So I'm, I'm not an expert on the design of inclusionary zoning. I just mentioned that it's very, very important that very low income people get to participate. I wouldn't design an ordinance in a way where 
only very low income people got to participate, right? Um, to me, you know, all of my proposals are more at the um, business people say like the 20, 30,000. It's more about the principles, right? The mandate of inclusion, which that in itself is transformative, right? The mandate and the understanding and building constituencies for this idea that understanding that the reason we have such extremes was because of anti-Black animus. And in fact, there are studies that show today that typically the most exclusionary affluent places, particularly high-income exclusionary suburbs, um, they tend to have a lot of anti-Black bias and they've shown that their exclusionary codes were animated by anti-Black bias, right? So tackling that, um, um, building consensus for the idea that no, going forward, we should be promoting inclusive housing. And that's just one thing, right? Um, you, 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 know, you have to fight the long fight for inclusionary neighborhoods and, and, and schools. But at the same time, I'm arguing that, you know, descendants trapped in concentrated poverty because of um, decades of, of, of harmful state policies, you know, that the state is obligated to repair what white supremacy still breaks today, right? That those neighborhoods deserve in priority investment now because they've been disinvested in for a very long time. Um, you know, it, uh, I'm a Christian uh, and I, I cite the Bible, you know? Jesus said the last shall be first, right? And, and that's what rep, re, true repair and reconciliation, true abolition and freedom from this system of residential caste would mean that people, uh, the descendants would have real choice and options and would have more opportunity in their neighborhoods. Um, first in line for the lottery for access to great schools. First in line, you know, for, or you know, I, I give examples of some cities have made bus routes from the poorest neighborhoods free. You know, those, those kinds of things. Um, they should have the smallest class sizes. You know, if they're, if, if they're, if, if you're in a school where hundred percent of the kids are poor and there's schools like that in DC, that's the result of intentional policy. And I think those schools, which, you know, some people call apartheid schools, they should have dramatically more resources than others. Um, you know, let me, add, I don't want to be argumentative, but let me yes, give you an example. I, I invited me, you. We like to argue, don't we? Let, me, let me give you an example of uh, a disastrous, the last shall be first policy. Okay. As, as you uh, know, I'm sure, uh, but most of um, our viewers today don't, or this evening don't. Um, Prior to about 1950, public housing in this country was mixed income. Lots of working class families lived there who were paying the full cost of the housing and their rent uh, without subsidy, uh, as well as poor people. Uh, Well-intended uh, public housing officials decided at that point to evict all of the working class families from public housing on the grounds that the poor people needed the units more. And so they did. And uh, the family's incomes rose, they were evicted. If mm -hmm. um, the, the public housing projects no longer had the people, the maintenance people who are, who are taking care of the projects, living in them themselves, caring about them. What we wound up doing was concentrating poverty uh, and public housing became um, dysfunctional, a disaster. Right. So, so I, I'm totally against that, okay? Mm -hmm. um, now, I'll I, I, I think we should, since you brought this up, we should make this clear, right? Not only did um, governments, you know, I think of, you, you said Chicago is one of your favorite places. Chicago, it is. Chicago <laughs> textbook example of this, right? Uh, what happens when you require that 100% of the people in a dense high rise building be poor? Boom, overnight, you've constructed a ghetto but Chicago and many other places racialized it. All right, so that was, that was wrong as a matter of policy to take away 
economic mixture and create concentrated poverty. But Chicago led the country in teaching others to do this. They also assigned um, residents based on race. So, you know, these places over here are for black pe poor people and these places over here are for white people. Well, you know, um, that concentrated, that accelerated the vicious um, anti-black feeling that a lot of whites in Chicago had. And then the decrepit conditions that came, came to be associated with high rise projects. You're right. I mean, part of it, what, what happened, it was a perfect storm, right? The economy was changing and deindustrializing. So a lot of the, the good paying working class and middle class jobs that residents of public housing could have gotten moved out of the city, uh, moved overseas, right? So a lot of people couldn't afford to pay rents um, that would sustain the capital necessities, right? So it, that was an unmitigated disaster. That's different from what I'm saying, right? I call for abolition of existing um, anti-Black policies and repair and replacement of them with um, policies that are, are the opposite, but also, um, you know, the first thing I say is the first step to abolition is changing the lens. I say that the state needs to change the nature of its relationship with high poverty black neighborhoods. Um, the lens from presumed thug to presumed citizen. And, and, and once you do that, you free yourself up to pursue evidence-based policies that actually might cost less um, and are more effective, particularly when it comes to crime prevention. And I, and I hold up examples of this. You know, Chicago, going back to your favorite city, right? Chicago, the, combined with the state of Illinois, right? They spend about a billion dollars every four years to incarcerate incarcerate uh, people who live in inner city high poverty blocks. There's 851 high poverty census tracts in the city. They spend about a million dollars per block every four years to incarcerate people, right? Um, and meanwhile, black neighborhoods, even working class and middle class black neighborhoods have largely been, uh, you know, have not been benefiting from all of this massive public investment in development. Um, a st uh, 2019 study found that uh, in Chicago, white neighborhoods receive, receiving three times as much public and private investment as black neighborhoods. I give the example of the large working class neighborhood of Austin um, in Chicago. One of the largest neighborhoods in the city was savaged by the foreclosure crisis and largely cut out of the city's major development programs. But meanwhile, they're spending mightily for incarceration. Um, and a lot of it for nonviolent crimes, right? And I give the example of Richmond, California. How did it approach its gun violence? Um, it had homicide rates worse than Chicago. Um, a much One of the highest homicide rates in the country. A person who saw the two dozen people who, roughly two dozen people who were most likely to pull the trigger in Richmond, California, who saw himself in them and saw these young men, they were all men, um, as three dimensional human beings uh, worthy of and, and who could, who were capable of transformation. You know, he came up with an idea to give them all a 18 month peacemaker fellowship in which they wrap them in 24 seven care, mentorship, um, ask them what they need to have a different life. Um, and the vast majority of them took that. They gave them the same resources that affluent people give their kids daily and violence. And this was, they started with a $600,000 grant, you know, and, and a little bit of seed money from philanthropy and violence, gun violence fell by 55%. All right, so that's an example of a transformative uh, abolitionist approach to anti-black predation. Well, let me just say that uh, I know I know you're getting me into trouble by 
keep on ahead. telling you keep on telling people that my favorite city is Chicago. I just want to make clear I like Philadelphia too. So <laughs> it's not don't get me wrong. <laughs> like most cities, particularly in our um, But you were just talking about um, you know brings up something that you wrote about in your book, and that is ghetto myths, right? The stereotypes that we have of. Um, how do we abolish? How do we fight those? How do we abolish those? How do we challenge those? Okay, so let me just take two sentences first to 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 summarize what I said. Um, we we're now I mean, Law and Order and Thug, Super Predator, um, a, a lot of the lang welfare queen, right? Um, we've been at this for more than five decades. You know, starting with George Wallace. And um, Richard Nixon, sorry, I had a senior moment, right? Richard Nixon in 1968. And the, the, the point is that anti-Black stereotypes were part of the politics of these peculiar institutions. Um, negative stereotypes from slavery to Jim Crow to the iconic ghetto to mass incarceration. He or she who controls the narrative about Black people has also drove the policy um, direction. And the main players in this, what I call ghetto mythologizing, have been presidents and presidential aspirants, the most gross and transparent one, most recently being Trump, you know. Um, so how do you um, counteract that? Well, I I'll say that I, I thought the hardest thing to do in my proposed steps to abolition was to change the lens, to see black people in human three-dimensional terms. And I'll say that the, the slow execution of George Floyd changed a lot. Um, I think a lot of people after watching that, uh, black people had a lot of uh, allies coming to them. Um, you know, how you human, you, you just reject it, right? You, you, you know, when Pete, you call it out, when, pe when people participate in it and you don't vote for um, politicians who trade in it. I think that kind of rhetoric has been, um, is, is a non-starter in democratic politics today. I mean, we've already kind of had that transformation in the democratic column. I can't imagine any um, Democrat uh, using that kind of language and winning um, in a democratic primary um, at the state level or certainly not at the national level. In fact, the transformation we saw with Joe Biden is, and this is the first presidential aspirant I had seen prioritizing racial equity and racial justice since Robert Kennedy in 1968. Um, so it's been done on the democratic side. Um, well, but you but, know, people, it's not up to black people to perform for others in ways that make them comfortable. It's up to other people to give black people the same benefit of the doubt, right? White criminals get to be individuals, right? But somehow a black criminal in, in a lot of people's minds represents an entire race. It's up to, I mean, this is what Ibrahim Kendi writes about, you know, it's up to everybody to work at being anti-racist and not participating in that kind of dogma. But how do we get there? How do we get other people not to participate in that kind of dogma? Well, I, I, I hold out examples of uh, uh, what legal scholar Robin Leonard calls uh, equality innovating cities. Um, you know, I don't have a lot of optimism right now about American politics, particularly at the national level. But one thing that gives me hope is that the people drawn to cities uh, tend to be a lot more open-minded about this distance. I'm not, I'm not being Pollyannish about it, but I think it's much easier to get to 51% on a city council debate uh, for a um, pick your program, whether it's promoting integrated schools or racial equity and funding um, or, or you know, pick your issue, right? 
or transforming policing. Um, there is a multiracial constituency out there now who wants something better than a separate and equal country that's premised on fear and division, right? We had uh, in the summer of 2020, there were 2,500 uh, nonviolent protests where people were holding up signs across this country saying Black Lives Matter. I think there's a majority consensus now for saner public policies, right? But we still have uh, people like Donald Trump who are willing to engage in this kind of rhetoric. So it's, it's a battle of mobilization. It's a battle of voter registration. Um, but, you know, I, I, I believe in building power to do something, right? And rather than just having conversations like, oh, you shouldn't see black people that way, right? Or, or, or you know, you shouldn't use that language. Um, and, you know, like the, for example, um, the Minneapolis move to repeal its single family zoning, there was a, there was a multi-year education process behind that where people were going to civic meetings and putting up slides with the maps and educating people, probably a lot of them handing people your book or putting your book in front of them, the forgotten history. And, and for a lot of people, I mean, I think this is why your book is so successful. It's like, I didn't know this, you know, I had no idea that we have all this, you know, dirty, I mean, this nasty history of anti-Black discrimination in housing. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to move that debate forward to say in the here and now of, uh, you know, to the people, I'm, I'm not trying, Richard, I have no illusion of converting people who have racism in their heart or whatever, who are, you know, who, who are about supremacists or about nationalists. My, my thing is trying to reach the reachable, right? And I think there are a lot of reachable people um, and if you can hold up examples of like, well, to the, what I, what do I do? Here's examples of success. You know, I gave the example of Louisville and how it went over a 20 year period from being hyper segregated to moderately segregated and building a culture and ethos that where people want integrated public schooling. They want the kind of, um, um, pretty aggressive policies to make sure that no schools overwhelmed by poverty. So you build that, that, that kind of consensus. Um, and frankly, if we um, invested in poor black neighborhoods the way we should be doing, um, I think people would begin to, to, to associate blackness with more positive things. Well, you gave the example uh, before Montgomery County. Just uh, quickly, we have to go to the Q&A soon, and we should, but mm -hmm. give, give a couple of other examples from your book of, of programs that have been successful. Okay, I gave the example for gun violence of, of the uh, Peacemaker Fellowships. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I gave the example of uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts, and several others of uh, uh, making transportation, public transportation free for people mm -hmm. who are highly dependent on it to get to jobs. Um, another example, uh, in addition to deregulating, um, uh, scrapping exclusionary zoning, um, there are some mayors, some cities, Stockton, California was the leader that have experimented with a universal basic, basic income pilot for people who live in poverty, who are not just poor, but live in poverty. And surprise, surprise, $500 a month of, of unconditional money uh, made life a lot better for poor people, right? Um, so let's see, what else? What other well, but let me just say that, uh, but then the mayor of Stockton was defeated. Well, the election. He, I don't think he was defeated on that policy, was he? But, but what, what, I, you know, whether it was him or not, there's now you can find a, a website called Mayors for a Guaranteed Income. The mm -hmm. idea is spreading. 
something like 30 odd mayors around the country are looking at this. Then, they, you know, this was in the New York Times uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, they mentioned, I don't know, about 15 cities who are really thinking about engaging with this question of reparations. It's uh. interesting though, um, Almost all of it is reparation. They use this term reparations, which is associated with repairing for slavery. Um, but almost all of it seems to be actually uh, atoning for the sins that you cover in your book, the sins of the first two thirds of the 20th century. Um, so, you know, I, I, I use the word repair, not reparations because, um, the systems of uh, segregation and predation and overinvestment in affluent space continue. Um, and, and, and we need to repair that and disrupt that. But, you know, if you want to call giving a UBI to people who've been forced through generations to live in concentrated policy because of state, state policy. Um, if you want to call that reparations, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily do it, but I do think that um, it's utterly justifiable to atone for that um, with extra supports. Well, with that, I think, um, anything you want to say in conclusion before we turn to questions, um, aside from the fact that people should read your book for more? Yeah, well, um, one thing I'll say is I did my very best uh, um, this is my personal library, you know, full of some of my favorite books. Um, I did my very best to use story to tell the story of descendants. You know, it's a very, uh, uh, you know, each chapter features someone, you know, I got this idea from you, Richard. I was like, I need some of his mojo. <laughs> but, you know, my hope is that, uh, you know, people will pick it up. It's not just a wonky book. It really uh, is a passionate love letter to Black Americans who've been oppressed by segregative policies and cut off from opportunity and from some of the largest wealth building programs subsidized by the state. Um, I hope you'll enjoy it as a, just a good read and I encourage you to pick it up. Thank you. Well, thank you, Cheryl. And Laura, do we have any questions? We have plenty of questions and I am back. I sure. want to thank you so much for your scholarship. It is important everywhere, of course, in this country, but it's critically important in Philadelphia and it's critically important uh, in the library space as well. And I appreciate your work. And Richard, we appreciate your preparation and thank you. Um, I'm going to start with a question of my own. It's about policing. Um, you talk about it, this in your surveillance chapter. I wonder if you could unpack for the audience um, how the system, the residential caste system has been linked to racist policing and also linked to lower income areas um, being viewed as a high crime area. Yeah, so a, a, a neighborhood being racially identifiable, particularly identifiable as black facilitates a different type of policing in that neighborhood than would happen in others. And I cite studies that show that police are much more likely uh, to use excessive force and tactics that would not be tolerated in middle-class white neighborhoods, certainly not affluent neighborhoods, right? So it facilitates a different kind of policing and a pred predatory policing. Um, the social distinctions that come naturally to people become much more efficient when you overlay geography, right? And so, you know, it's like those people live over there and it's easier to target them and treat them differently, not just for predatory policing, but for predatory lending um, as well, right? The other thing is that people who have no intimate experience with black people get their ideas often about black people from what they, think or imagine goes on in the hood, right? Um, and when people, and the, what living in white space, the average white person lives in a neighborhood that's 75% white, that's the average, right? Um, what living in white space can do to people is they're used to being dominant 
Um, and when they see a black body somewhere where they don't expect to see it doing utterly ordinary things, um, that can stimulate them uh, calling the police or in the tragic situation of poor Ahmaud Aubrey, you know, jumping in the truck and chasing them down when they're just jogging, right? Um, and it, interestingly, some of the most friction but where uh, white people, it's heavily, often it's whites, um, call the police, you know, uh, is in neighborhoods that are gentrifying, where whites are moving into black and brown space and, in, in, and they're not dominant yet. And they're seeing things that's frightening to them or they just, just don't like, like, you know, a 105 year old man playing dominoes on the sidewalk, which he'd done unmolested for 40 years until people started gentrifying, right? Um, there were about a thousand calls on, on this man. Right, so that's what geog how geography plays a role in this, um, and the mythology, the way you know way people are taught to think about black people, conscripts non elites into policing bo black bodies, and it's not that different than the the slave patrols of the past, um, in terms of its function. Let me add, if I may, Laura, you know, it's, it, you say it's not much different than slave patrols in the past. It's not much different from something else, too. When you concentrate the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods where they don't have much access to good jobs or transportation to get to those jobs or schools that aren't overwhelmed with the social and economic problems of their children, it's inevitable that the police are going to engage in confrontations with them. If you want a model, just look at India or the Congo or any colonial country and see how occupying forces maintain control over disadvantaged populations. Um, we shouldn't expect anything different here. The problem is not racism of the police. The problem is that we're concentrating the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods where the confrontations with the police are going to be inevitable. There you go, it's a system of residential caste. And I cite social scientists to say, the ghetto is a mechanism of social control. I'd like to uh, just unpack one more thing for the audience. And just a reminder, please submit your questions for the Q&A or you're stuck with all of my questions. Um, it's just a follow-up though, your chapter called Abolition and Repair. I just wonder if you could kind of talk about why you chose the word abolition. It's It's got a historical context, of course, and then more recently it's been used in terms of policing or in, con in the context of policing, that is. And I wonder why you chose it um, for the title of the chapter. Very intentionally um, to make it clear that we need something that's not just modest reform around the edges. You know, each generation keeps kicking the can down the road, right? Um, we, and, and our anti-Black structures have metastasized. And I say, you know, we, so the original abolition was incomplete in the sense that we still have this structure that was born of white supremacy, right? And if you don't believe that, you can you go back and read Richard's book. I, you can read my book. I go through the history. Uh, more quickly, right, and to get to the present, but uh, violence-backed containment of Black people. Uh, so we need to abolish, and, we, and I, you know, I wanted to associate myself with this new movement calling for abolition. We do need to abolish the processes of supremacy that still exist, and, I, and uh, you know, I took pains to identify them so that by the time you got to the end, you, you couldn't say you didn't know, right? So abolition and repair, right? And, but I, you know, I, I think of it in the positive terms. I associate, I, I got this, this was um, W.E.B. Du Bois re re rhetoric. Um, he said, you know, at the turn of the century that we need to create an abolition democracy. This is what I'm talking about, this multiracial power for, for you know, that lives up to create structures that do live up to our professed values. So that's why I chose it. To, it also does emphasize just what I said, the, the unbroken continuum. 
Thank you very much. Um, this is from the audience. This is Dr. Lloyd Sheldon Johnson says, I hope we will receive copies of this transcript. I'm from Detroit originally, and this is an awesome, in all capitals, presentation. Um, yes, this will be, you can see this video on our YouTube page and check out the transcript there. Uh, we'll have a podcast as well. Um, this is from Jonathan. No, you can also buy the book. It's you Hello. and your book. book. You think it's and awesome. Have, the book is yeah. awesome. <laughs> 15 minutes to get a signed book plate. Um, I posted the link in the chat a couple times, but click that link, buy yourself a book with a signed book plate. Um, can you point to another society that has managed to affect the kind of systemic change to eradicate race or identity-based inequality that has been successful and that we can use as a model? Well, um, I, I do look at, it's not, you know, it's not race-based, but I do think that Germany, modern Germany has done a better job than the United States in facing its, its Nazi past, you know, and, and, and forcing people to deal with it, right? Um, I'm not saying it's perfect, but um, I think they've done better than we have. It's, it's, there's a sense in which it feels like we're just getting started in some ways where, you know, people are recognizing that all these Confederate monuments, and I, I'm not, I'm, you know, I, I, I would like to see more the kind of repair I talked about in the book, but symbols do matter. You know, we were just now taking down symbols that um, honor traitors to our country. You know, um, I, you know, I, I'll say this. I had the privilege to, to grow up in Huntsville, Alabama. I was born, I'm not gonna say when I was born, but anyway, I was a child of the 60s, the 60s and civil rights movement. But I did attend public schools in the era, I came of age in the era when the South was really trying to make good. And each year in public, I went to public school for 12 years. They were well-resourced, integrated public schools where kids from the projects and wealthy kids all went to school together, you know? And I was able to go from that public school education to Vanderbilt and graduate summa in electrical engineering. I was prepared, right? And it was, you know, it felt like the land of opportunity. I had broke parents, but I could go to public school and do well and move on. And the very same high school I went to ended up being shut down because it became overwhelmed by poverty and associated with you know, poor black kids and they just shut it down, right? So there's a sense in which we're worse, it feels to me, than when we were trying uh, in the 70s and early 80s. Um, um, it was a good time to grow up, you know? Um, I, you know, I think we're, 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 we're more divided now. So I give that example because it felt like we were getting better, you know? Um, and frankly, if you smoked a little marijuana, you didn't get arrested for it, right? It was before the mass incarceration, right? And I offer that as a different vision to what we have now. You know, a toxically divided country, you know, particularly in red states like Alabama, you know, where there's a lot of mistrust in government. Um, but we've done better in different areas now, I believe. I really believe that. And, and, and the fact that I can't hold up a, a Nirvana example, you know, I mean, it, Canada is so much better than us, I think, but Canada didn't have slavery on its soil, right? Um, so you asked me to compare us to countries that had slavery on their soil, it's tough, you know, it is really, really tough. But the alternative is not to just give up. And, and the last thing I'll say, this is some hope. Um, Raj Chetty's work, The Economist out of Harvard, you know, where they, they've uh, uh, done indicators of social mobility for poor children, um, some places are doing pretty good, you know? Places that allow uh, poor, poor residents to live among middle-class people have, surprise, surprise, more social mobility. You 
you know, and you can go at Ross Chetty's index and look at the ones that are doing better. And you can also see the ones down at the bottom. And a lot of the ones down at the bottom are places like Baltimore that had a lot of great migrants. Thank you. Uh, this question is from Tony. If the Fed jumped in, what would you have them do? And is it feasible? Oh, that, that's beyond my competence. I really am not up on what the Fed is capable of doing. Richard, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I interpret the question as if the federal government jumped in, not Are the you, Fed. When they said the Fed, the, oh, I, I thought the Fed was the Federal Reserve Bank. Oh, no. oh, okay, I take the question back. <laughs> I, I, I um, wrote about this in the book. I also written about this in two different pieces. I'm a contributing editor for Politico and you can read those as well. But the federal government is most complicit, I believe, in sponsoring residential caste. Going back to starting with the redlining and, and every, everything else in the 30s, right? The federal government, if we had a, a better politics, could ban exclusionary zoning or condition that, you know, that the, the enormous funds we send to, to, to localities and states for development infrastructure dollars condition that on repealing ex exclusionary zoning. Um, it could do that, it, it, it has the power to do that. Um, whether it will is another thing. It can definitely, you know, uh, reinstate, as I understand they're moving to do the Biden administration, they could reinstate Obama's affirmatively furthering fair housing regulation. Um, they could proceed with the racial equity uh, executive order. And I, as I understand they are, you know, hours, within hours of becoming president, Joe, uh, Joe Biden signed an executive order mandating a review of where federal dollars are going, um, racial inequity and mandating the agencies consider how they can promote racial equity as they go. Um, so there's lots they could do. Um, they could also, you know, repair voting rights, you know, pass some of these um, voting rights bills that John Lewis and others championed. Um, there's a lot the federal government could do with a better, saner politics. I, I think there's a majority consensus for more fairness right now. It's just that we're stymied by structural um, mechanisms, some of which were created to protect slavery, you know, the electoral college, the filibuster, um, par extreme partisan gerrymandering, um, you know, eat your chia seeds and live long enough to see us overcome some of these structural barriers to majoritarian fairness and sanity. Richard, would you like to address that question? Well, um, I, I don't disagree with anything that Cheryl said, but my uh, focus some, is somewhat different. I don't think that the federal government is going to change until we have a, a locally based civil rights movement in this country that's going to engage in the kinds of um, making good trouble that John Lewis talked about. Because if we want to make progress at the federal level, as in the 1960s, it has to start locally. So um, I, I, uh, I think that's the way we need to make progress. You know, Cheryl um, referred to the, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Uh, you know, 20 million Americans participate in those. Of those 20 million, most were white, but it was a one off. Right. And out of those uh, demonstrations, there haven't been emerging uh, local civil rights groups from that, that 20 million Americans who are going to um, uh, engage in uh, the redress of segregation in their own communities. Uh, it, Cheryl is correct that um, the federal government could address the issue of exclusionary zoning, but it's a local issue. Right. Local communities can address the issue of exclusionary zoning. And by exclusionary zoning, I mean the rules that say you can only build single family homes in the community. Well, that's only going to happen if there, there is local organization, a new, new civil rights movement that's locally based. So while I agree that there's lots that the federal government can do, I don't think it'll do it unless we have a, a new locally based civil rights movement. It's going to start from the bottom. It has to start from the bottom and move up. 
and every one of your viewers can participate in that. They can't participate in making federal policy, but they can participate in taking direct action in their own communities. Uh, I so agree with you. These. I totally agree with you. The questioner asks, what can the federal government do? But um, yeah, in my final chapter, I talk about, you know, this is what building an abolition democracy is. You, you got to fix democracy at the local level, build your multiracial uh, coalition for civil rights, for inclusion, for all of these things. Um, it, it, it was a one-off, Richard, last summer, but a number of people ran for office and got themselves elected out of that um, agitation. So, uh, but anyway, I, I do, do agree with you about the necessity of, of a bottom-up movement. There's, there's no shortcuts. This is the thing. Um, I mean, being a child of civil rights, I mean, my, my parents put everything on the line, but there's no shortcut for that kind of labor-intensive building of coalition to get things done. It's not going to happen without organization, agitation, gathering power. It's just not. Thank you so much. I like to think our audience is engaged and reachable. Um, like you said in your talk, I we have a number of good questions. I'm very sorry to not get to more of them. Um, I, I have time for just one more. Uh, you give examples of successes in addressing abolition and repair. What communications structures exist to share this information on an ongoing basis and encourage replication and mentorship to teach the goals of racial equity and repair of current and past injustices? Well, you know, there are a number of uh, organizations. Um, I mean, I'm not the first to say racial equity. I'm not the first to say, talk about abolition and repair. Um, there's been a lot, there are a lot of scholars and they're like public policy organizations um, that are focusing on this. Um, I hesitate to start ticking them off because I won't remember them all. Um, but I, you know, I, I keep getting the people who are enthusiastic about the book, oh, can you serve as a consultant for me? And, you know, no, I can't. But um, at least, you know, if you read the book, you, you will, I cite so many organizations that are doing things. Um, I don't wanna just promote myself, but um, Policy Link comes to mind. An organization called GARE comes to mind. If you Google racial equity, it depends on what you're interested in. You know, if you're interested in housing inclusion, there are organizations pushing that. If you're interested in racial equity, there are organizations pushing that. If you're interested in reparations, you know, so, uh, or policing, they're different things, right? Um, but maybe what I, I will do is post on my website links to organizations that seem to be relevant, but, you know, um, I wish I could give you a better answer. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your work and for this talk to our audience. Thank you so much for coming. I just posted the link again to buy the book. Please buy the book, um, read the book, share the book. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Any closing words from either of you before we close? I'd like to thank my friend Richard Rothstein for taking the time. It's very kind of you. You're a very busy man and I appreciate it so much. And I want to thank the Free Library of Philadelphia. Next time I'm up there, I'll be sure to come to come see you. I usually go to the museums, but it is a wonderful city. And thank you for to the audience.